Hi there, welcome to Outdoor Gear Chat. Uh, my name's Wayne, hello. Um, we're here for episode 47. I'm joined as always by Cathy, hello. Hi Wayne, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm proper excited about this mammoth seven-hour podcast that we're going to be doing now. <laughs> and I, I, I was waiting for the wave of shock to go over the face of our guest then, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this one. So what? yeah, what are we talking about today? Oh, well, you're absolutely right. It is a mammoth, uh, a mammoth podcast. It's a mammoth topic, actually. It's not going to be a mammoth podcast. It's going to be a mammoth topic. And I think we're just going to scratch the absolute surface of um, what has been and will continue to be a very long conversation um, around waterproof fabrics. Um, first of all, I mean, some people might be turning off now, actually, because they've heard the word waterproof fabrics. However, um, having been in the industry for you know nearly 30 years, this period now is probably one of the most exciting periods because um, there is a huge amount of change. There's a huge amount of energy. There's a huge amount of new technology coming into play for very, very good reason. And that's simply because um, traditional waterproof fabrics um, haven't been very good for the planet. Um, and uh, uh, to make sure that uh, our beautiful world is going to be here for the future, unsolid for our future generations, it's really important that we make some changes. So we have with us um, today a super duper guest um, who came up to me at uh, a recent industry conference and said, can we make a podcast because I am sick of the industry just lying to customers and we need to tell the truth. And I was just like, oh my God, yes, <laughs> let's do this. This is absolutely what needs to happen. Um, and it's, I'm not sure it's even sort of... Um, lying per se that's perhaps not the right word to use in this instance but literally people have just been so worried about all these huge changes and how to communicate them so that's what we're going to start doing here um on on this first of three specials waterproof specials um and uh, just looking and understanding that there is a world of science in our jackets and our waterproof garments um and uh, it's really important that suppliers and retailers come together and help customers understand what that science is so they can make great choices for the future so um, without further ado, I'm going to say a very big hello to Debbie Reed, who is head of corporate communications and uh, CSR at Equip Outdoor Technologies. Hi, Debbie. Hi, that's not easy to say, is it? It's just... there's, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I there's a lot of there's lots of that. this morning. <laughs> And that's even abbreviating the CSR bit as well. Isn't it? Yeah. I know. Can you, um, in fact, CSR, can you just tell us what CSR is? Because there's going to be a lot of three letter acronyms in this podcast. Yeah. So we need to be mindful we uh, we explain them. Yeah. So CSR, corporate social responsibility, it just means that we try and do business the right way. Yeah. Sum it up easily. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely brilliant. Um, so before we delve into our waterproofs, um, I'm just going to give a very, very oversimplified explanation of uh, what a waterproof is so people can sort of visualise as we go through. So um, you've got a choice when you buy a waterproof garment, you can buy a coated waterproof garment, you could buy a layered waterproof garment or what's what we talk about kind of three layer. Um, and the waterproof part of your jacket isn't necessarily the part that you're looking at. It's not that coloured fabric on the outside. The actual waterproof of your uh, part of your jacket could be coating on the inside and it could be sandwiched in between the lining and the outer. Um, that lovely coloured fabric on the outside of your garment that makes it look super funky, um, that is treated with a chemical treatment called a DWR, that's durable water repellency. And that chemical treatment is what helps the water bead up and run off. When your jacket's lovely and new at the beginning of the day, you can see those little beads and uh, they all join together and they all run off and you've got a, a fantastically optimum working waterproof garment right there. As the day goes on or as that chemical treatment um, gets contaminated, maybe it can't work as effectively and you see a jacket go dark and it looks wet and it can feel a little bit clammy. So that's what's called wetting out and that's that chemical treatment not working at its optimum. Doesn't mean it's not working at all and you, can't, and you can regenerate it. We're gonna talk about that later. But it's really important that we start with that and people uh, can understand there's a difference between a DWR and actually the waterproof part component of your jacket. Um, so I think probably 
um, just giving an overview of RAB, Debbie, would be really helpful because um, they haven't just popped up out of nowhere. Um, they are a very big company and corporation, but they're not a bad corporation. I don't believe there's anybody sitting at the top in a large high back chair stroking a cat <laughs> with a bejeweled yeah. hand. <laughs> Well, do you know we've got plenty of dogs in the office? Uh, no, no cats today. Um, yeah, so we're we're Rab. Um, I imagine many of the people who listen to this podcast and who go into most of the UK outdoor retail stores will know Rab. Um, we are owned by Equip Outdoor Technologies, um, hence why my job title is so complicated. Uh, Rab was um, developed by Rab Carrington, nineteen eighty one, um, in a little terraced house in Sheffield. Uh, business is still headquartered in the UK. We're known for insulated products. So, you know, the famous Microlite, Rab sleeping bags. We still actually hand make and hand fill Rab uh, down sleeping bags just across the road from me here in Derbyshire. Um, we've sort of moved into way more products than just sleeping bags now. So, you know, hence being on here, shell products. Um, maybe partly due to the weather, but also partly due to just, you know, uh, recognising the growth there. We're, we're now selling as many shell products as we do um, insulated products, but also just a wide range of outdoor kit. Um, we also have Low Alpine as part of our um, Equip Outdoor Technologies brand. So you'll often see Rab and Low Alpine sort of partnered together. Um I think that's us really. That's who we are. Um, to Kathy's point, there isn't a big bad boss that's stroking a cat. Um, we are headquartered in the UK, but we've got offices around the globe. We've sort of managed to grow far and wide. We've got offices in North America, across Europe, um, but still a fairly small business. There's sort of 250 people. Um, and I think one of the things we're really proud of is a lot of the people, and we were having a quick chat before this call, actually, a lot of the people are outdoor people. Um, we're climbers, we're hikers, we're bikers. Um, the products are still designed by people who are doing the activities they're designed for. And that's something we're really proud of. So whether you're in speaking to our team in North America or in Germany or in Norway or in the UK, we're people who go outside, we get wet, we get cold, we understand the challenges. And I think that's why working in this industry is so great, actually. And that's that's a dead. I want, I want to just focus on that point of getting wet as well, is because that's one of the principles of everything that we want to talk about in this series, I guess, isn't it? We've all we've almost as as, as outdoor enthusiasts or what or, or yeah, particularly um, um, from a you know if if you're not a, not a specialist or an athlete, we've become quite scared of getting wet in the outdoors. And I guess that's one of the things that that that's going to be a theme throughout what we're going to talk about, isn't it? Is is that well? Yeah, it's it, it, it's part of life sometimes is yeah things kit fails or yeah we've got that balance of uh of of of, 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 of how that works yeah I, I totally agree and and kathy talked about me accosting her at a, a show we went to this summer um i have a uh this is a personal rather than a rab opinion i think that we as an industry have made people scared of getting wet getting wet is okay uh, and it can be quite fun. Um, getting wet and cold, that is where things start to become a problem. And what we try and do as, you know, an outdoor company is make sure that people understand about you know performance and getting cold and protecting themselves. But actually getting wet is OK. Um, if you want to not get wet, you need to wear a bin bag. Um, <laughs> that will stop you getting wet or you stay indoors. If you want to go outside and you want to move, you need to have something that is breathable and something which is fit for purpose. And that will involve you probably getting wet at some point, doing whatever activity it is you're doing, but that's okay. And that, and that, they, there was a sort of a, an, an analogy that we were, we were talking about earlier, which was that, yeah, if you want to stay dry, wear a bin bag. If you want to breathe, use an umbrella, I think, wasn't it? And I, I absolutely love that. And I know there'll be a few people listening that, uh, that are friends of ours that always carry umbrellas when they're going yeah. outdoors anyway. It's a really, yeah, but a, but, but a brilliant one. Yeah. Um, so to, yeah, talk talk to us about a, l a little bit about the, the changes that are going on, Debbie, and why why it's important that we're here talking today, I guess. Yeah, and Kathy alluded it to it a little bit. Um, as an industry, we've used um, what we've called, uh, well, we've called them lots of things, and sorry, there will be some acronyms in here. We've called them fluorocarbons. People might have heard of them as C8, C6, PFAS, DWRs, PFCs. 
all of them essentially are, as, as Kathy described very eloquently, thank you, Kathy. Um, <laughs> it's a coating that is put onto the fabric that helps um, detract water and, and oils. Um, what it does is it's, it's essentially a, a hydrophobic treatment. So it makes sure that water will run away. The oils don't stick to it. And the reason why we're so concerned about oils is oils attract dirt and dirt, therefore, stops breathability and allows water to seep in. So since we've really started developing all the new highly technical products that we've seen since the 80s onwards, many, many outdoor brands have used these fluorocarbon treatments. Um, they're a man-made chemical treatment. Um, they work really, really well. I mean, and, and, you know, the iconic images of, you know, beaded water on beautiful bright red or bright yellow fabrics is what certainly I've grown up with. Um, but they work really well to the point where I speak to people regularly who talk to me about the jacket they've had in their wardrobe for 20 years and 30 years, and it still beads and it's still amazing and all the new stuff isn't as good. The reason why that product works so well is that these this chemical that we've been using actually is what's known as persistent in the environment. It doesn't break down. So it won't break down in sunlight. It won't wash off in water. Um, it actually exists and, and at the minute, research is still underway but it's difficult to know if it actually will ever break down so they are sort of you know rather sadly but probably accurately being called forever chemicals now are these a problem we think they probably are um, they're starting to be seen you know in sort of water supplies and places that they shouldn't be and as an outdoor industry we all did it um, we've all been using them for years we now all recognize that that's not okay so we're looking for alternative solutions. What's happening at the same time is legislation is forcing the industry to change. Now, many, many brands out there, us and, and many of our sort of peers in the marketplace have already been working on alternatives. And for the last sort of 10, 15 years, we've been experimenting with different solutions. The pace of change is now accelerating as that legislation's coming in, um, which is making it, it's making performance different. It's making consumers mistrust what they're seeing. And, you know, to Kathy's point and, and what I mentioned earlier is you probably won't see that beautiful little round beading on products that we've all grown up with. These products, these fabrics, these chemicals, they work a bit differently now. They still work, but I think we've not done a good enough job educating consumers in the difference and the reason why. I think um, it's also really interesting to sort of go back and, and look at history um, and uh, sort of Gore-Tex was, was created as this, this, this wonder product as a result of um, research of, into fabrics to keep people, astronauts alive in space. So we've got this amazing cutting edge technology um, that's been put into everyday clothing and everyday footwear. Um, and the net result is we've got something that should have been used that, that performs amazingly, um, that should have been used in a, a very niche environment and um, spread out and used in a in a mass environment. Um, and the, the consequences are as we're finding out. But as you said, quite rightly, Debbie, it's not a quick thing that's just popped up. Um, I think it was 2009 um that uh, uh governments first um decided to to think about banning these substances it wasn't until 10 years later in 2019 it became legislation in the eu uh, and in the usa um and we we're, we're not the first industry for this to happen in either um years ago we talked about cfcs um that were fluorocarbons excuse me, chlorofluorocarbons used in refrigeration, used in aerosols. Um, so this isn't a new thing. It's not just happening to us. It's happened in other things. As science progresses, we discover all oh, these are bad things. We won't use them. Um, and the world didn't end when the aerosol can <laughs> uh, um, found other ways. You know, other propellants were, were found. We still have um, fridges in our homes that are A star star rated. You know, there's um, uh, technology will will provide a solution, and we're on that journey um, currently at the moment. And uh, uh, and and the the end result is it's going to be better for everybody. But we just need to learn how to use our waterproofs um, a little bit different to how we have been. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that um, 
the outdoor industry is certainly taking this agenda and has been for the last you know 10 15 years and trying to come up with solutions we are not the only industry that uses fluorocarbons they are across many 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 industries so the carpets and floor tiles in you know most environments have got fluorocarbons on um the fabrics in your vehicles car seats are covered in them um the product that's in your frying pan that stops your eggs sticking to it, the <laughs> piece of paper that's in your pizza box, they're all covered in fluorocarbons. So this is a much bigger challenge than the outdoor industry on its own. And I think the outdoor industry is really taking accountability for trying to move the agenda forward and come up with solutions. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's I, I, you both described in there how things are accelerating and it's sort of, a, it's a, yeah, and the, I guess the point of this podcast partly is, is is the bunch of changes that are imminent now, aren't they, in the way that the clothing technology is going to be consumed, for one, I guess, for want of a better phrase. And then we, as, as those consumers, need to do stuff slightly differently. And so, yeah, just like I guess it's it's explaining what what that's gonna mean. And in yeah, no, obviously I've got the benefit of all the pre chat that we've had about it as well, and and the, you know the the treatment that we have to do on an ongoing basis with our kit might need to change somewhat. Yes, but I think um, probably if we go into like how they how the fabrics will work would probably be a really good um, thing to go into next. Um, and uh, and suddenly um, we're going to see uh, products announcing that they're um, PFAS free. Now that PFAS um, it stands for per or polyfluoro acyl substances i think i did you know i didn't put my my intelligent glasses on hang on let me just reread that uh, oh yeah per poly fluoroacyl substances there we go i've got me got my glasses on there <laughs> um so those are substances um that do not naturally appear in the environment now i did have somebody say but they do uh, and i said i looked into it and i said well you you're not wrong um, there is one, I'm going to put my intelligent glasses on, <laughs> there is one um, perfluorocarbon that does appear naturally in the environment in very small amounts, and that is carbon tetrafluoride that's emitted from granite in very small amounts. Um, but fundamentally, they're not. They're, they're, they're synthetic organic chemicals. So they are fluorine and, and carbon that are natural in the environment, but they've been combined by man to create this fantastic hydrophobic, um, very stable compound. Um, but uh, uh, so, yeah, so suddenly everyone is going to be talking about PFAS uh, and that's what they are. And your, your garments PFAS free. But Debbie, you can explain why not all PFAS free garments are equal. <laughs> Yeah, and you sort of make me, um, you make my stomach roll slightly when we talk about PFAS free. And that's not you, Kathy, that is us as an industry. We keep talking now about PFAS free because, as we're already hinting at, this is so complicated. Um, when we talk about PFAS free as an industry, um, there is a, there's almost a layer that we need to unpack here. One is whether we're talking about the fabrics, and, and Kathy, you did a great explanation of the different layers of fabrics and how we use coatings. But there's also an awful lot of components in many of our products. We're talking about zippers and we're talking about trims and elastics and um, clips and tags. And, and not everyone might understand, but there's also PFAS associated with those as well. So that waterproof zip isn't just magically waterproof. It's waterproof because we put these layer of fluorocarbons on zips as well. So when you are looking at the small print of products and you see something that says PFAS free or and what we've seen up till now is, PFC with a line through it, or we've seen lots of variations of this. It's not always the whole truth. We need to look at what does that actually mean? When we talk about PFAS free, we mean it's compliant with the legislation. And the legislation talks about no unintended PFAS is added. So as a product designer or developer, we haven't specced fluorocarbons in that product or that fabric. So there's often a difference between whether it's a fabric or whether it's the whole product. Um, fluorocarbons, as we've described, tend to exist in many places now. So there's often trace fluorocarbons included in products. So fluorocarbons are often used as a release agent for maybe something that's been molded. So like the toggle that's at the end of your zip pull or the toggle that's on your backpack or a zip. 
the, all of those little plastic components, they often have fluorocarbons as the release agent to get them out of the molds. If you test it, and you know, testing is a, a whole challenge we're not gonna get into today, thankfully. If you test it, you might find those fluorocarbons associated with its trace fluorocarbons, but we would still call that PFAS free because they weren't specced as part of the product, but they're actually still in the industry and they're still involved. There's also trace fluorocarbons that might be sort of left on conveyor in because it's in oils, it's in lubricants. So it does still exist everywhere. We have gradually been moving to fluorocarbon free solutions. Fabrics was where everyone's moved first but we've now started to really try and unpick all of the other components. And, you know, I mentioned um, zips there, waterproof zips kind of now, when you think about it, obviously have fluorocarbons on, but even the paint on some zip pullers we found had fluorocarbons on because the paint, if it's got a fluorocarbon in, it helps it stick to the aluminium zip puller better, which actually allows the durability of the zip pull. So there's, there's positive reasons why it was included, but we now know the associated damage. So it's not as easy as saying, does that product have fluorocarbons, yes or no? There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, it's it's super complex. And it I mean, this is this is my kind of I mean like nerd. <laughs> You're kind of here degree, yeah. Because when customers come in, uh, and it is, you know, it's a huge investment when you come in and you buy um a, a quality waterproof garment. It's been patterned to to fit around your body. Um it's uh, there's a huge amount of technology going on in the in the fabrics, but when there's so much other stuff, you know, and when you learn about just how many components there are in one garment. And, uh, and and you look at the price tag and think, blimey, <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's uh, all oh, right. That's <laughs> that's why it's that much. Um, it's uh, this there, there is, you know, and I said at the very beginning, there's so much science in your garment um, and we just it, it, we just don't talk about it and we just don't know about it. So. So, yeah, even even those little extra bits, um, it's just absolutely fascinating. So I suppose probably. Um, having sort of looked at the fluorocarbons in garments, why they're here, um, how will sort of future fabrics um, differ uh, from the current fabrics? We've have sort of touched on the beading, which is probably going to be the most obvious visual. Um, people are going to use their garments um, maybe just a couple of times, depending on how they're using them, how often they're scrunching them down, putting them in the rucksack. Um, maybe they're using them with midge repellent, maybe they're using them with sun creams, things like that. Um, and suddenly uh, that beading is going to vanish. And, uh, uh, and it's not that your jacket, as I said, it's not that your jacket is um, damaged or failing or leaking. Um, it's just not working to its optimum. Um, so I suppose I'm just looking at my um, fantastic notes here, Debbie, that you sort of all pulled together and, and talking about um, those sort of C6 and C8 technologies. And those that letter C stands for chain and the letter eight um, is obviously higher than the letter six. So C8 is a long chain. Um, those have been phased out in the durable water repellent treatment that creates that beading. And uh, and then we've moved on to um, C6, which is a lower number, therefore a shorter chain, um, uh, which is perhaps less bad <laughs> than a C8. Um, and uh, uh, so will we get down to like C0 at some point? <laughs> is that is that the aim to be yeah. really, um, for the environmental um and also human health you know yeah. um for uh to to, to protect uh, it is essential to phase that phase them out um uh how's that going to sort of work with fabrics in uh, in action yeah you're, you're absolutely right c8 was super bad c6 hmm. was less bad but still not okay and we are moving to c0 um, which is sh another shorthand way of saying PFAS free or PFAS compliant or fluorocarbon free. Um, it's essentially a different solution that doesn't have the same chain of fluorocarbons, totally different chemistry. There are multiple different solutions out there that are being tried and tested. And many of the big fabric suppliers and, you know, you sort of touched on Gore earlier, but, you know, th there's others out there as well. And as we're all trying different solutions. And the different solutions work depending on the fabric type that you're using and actually what you're trying to achieve 
from using that fabric type. And again, I would almost go back to us as an industry, maybe we've not been as honest as we should be about buying the right product for the right conditions. Um, you know, we sell our products using these extreme images of, you know, super athletes going doing crazy stuff on, you know, the highest mountains in the world, fully extreme. And actually a lot of our products aren't worn that way. You know, let's be honest. Um, you know, I've just come back from a, a, a very wet fortnight in the Highlands and um, there wasn't very much extreme stuff going on. There was a lot of weather. So <laughs> it's it's making sure that we're really selling consumers and educating consumers about the right products for the right conditions. So we are putting new solutions. We've, we're looking at our fabrics. We're looking at the uses but the education bit is missing. Consumers, and we've sold it to consumers, is this beautiful image of this beautiful little droplet on this beautiful piece of fabric. What we're seeing with the current solutions is less of that. You touched a bit earlier on, on consumers get concerned if they see fabric wetting out. Actually, some of these fluorocarbon free fabrics look like they wet out and they look like they wet out within 10 or 15 minutes. Consumers, don't like that it makes them anxious because we've educated to them that fabric shouldn't wet out the reality is it's just a different way that that solution works it sort of dissipates the 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 moisture and it moves it around the fabric in a different way it doesn't just roll off some fabrics they almost look like um, I describe it a bit like dimpled orange peel where you almost see tiny little potholes in the fabric and again we've never communicated that we've never put beautiful high-res photos of dimpled fabric so consumers see it and think my my waterproof is broken um the reality is it's not it's working well but it doesn't matter because consumers are losing faith and losing confidence in the product and it's not as good as the 20 year old one that's in the wardrobe hanging at home therefore it's broken and we've broken the industry so i think there's a lot of education around the right product and what it now looks like I also think that we need to be better at being able to communicate when condensation is becoming a problem versus so, so moisture out rather than moisture in. Yeah. And again, if you're working hard and fast, you're producing condensation. So consumers will send a product back to us and say, you know, I've got my shoulders have got really wet, but they might have got wet because of condensation gathering the, the shoulders and around your pack area rather than water's coming through. So I think there's a lot we need to do about what to look for as a consumer. Yeah, and I think it's really important as well to explain that the reason that uh, if that jacket's wetting out, that isn't getting back, isn't necessarily failing because that water can't physically enter the garment um, because of that waterproof coating or the membrane that you just can't see. The water's entering that outer fabric um, and perhaps creating an environment that is less conducive to moisture from the inside of the jacket or vapor from the inside of the track jacket or your sweat from the inside of the jacket being able to transfer out into the environment which is the traditional um way that uh, breathability breathable fabrics have worked so you do still have and you are still protected by that waterproof barrier as a coating or as a um a laminate um but how that outer coloured fabric um, responds to water. That's the key element of the jacket that is different um, with the modern um, and more environmentally friendly DWR, durable water repellent coatings. Yeah, and I think um, we touched at the beginning about the reason why fluorocarbons were used. It's because they're hydrophobic. So they don't like water and they don't like oil. Um, so one of the reasons that they work so well is that they actually repel oil and dirt. Um, if you're not looking after your fabric properly, you therefore will start to attract dirt on it. And dirt is one of the reasons why that membrane layer that you're describing so well, Cathy, stops working is because you actually get dirt in the way. And it's the dirt that actually stops the breathability. And that's then what starts to create that condensation layer. And therefore my waterproof jacket isn't working. Um, really interestingly, I was at um, a session last week where we looked at, um, it was a durability workshop looking specifically at um, waterproofs. 
um, that had been donated to this brilliant research project. Um, and they were waterproofs that were end of life. And when the research team looked at these end of life products, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but like many, 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 a high percentage of them had been donated because the waterproofing had stopped working. Hmm. And the reality was the it just needed treatment. It needed cleaning it. The waterproofing hadn't stopped working. It was the perception of the waterproof layer um, failing that had led these products to be discarded as end of life. Yeah, and the, the the end of the road for them ultimately is back in landfill where potentially these chemicals can leach back out. They can leach into the water system. Um, so, uh, and that's what we're sort of starting to learn could be happening. Um, but that um, perception of end of life is really interesting um, because as part of this three part series, we're going to be talking to a fabric and technology specialist next, Laura from Mountain Equipment. And then we're talking to Tim from Granger's as well after that. Um, and Granger's are obviously specialists in washing and maintaining um, all outdoor kit, but specifically waterproof fabrics. And uh, and that is going to be a real um, area that customers are going to need to change behaviors that's it's just gonna have to be and I think eventually we'll see um see us all needing to treat our waterproof garments that have always hung in the cupboard and performed seamlessly um we're going to be needing to wash them after every couple of uses perhaps eventually treat them as normal laundry um and and wash them after after each use and then do a reproofing at some point using a water-based reproofer too um so caring and maintenance is going to be uh, something that uh, is becomes more and more important. And that's something that you at RAB can help with as well, isn't it, Debbie? Yeah. And I think you raised the point earlier on. You talked about the, the technical expertise that goes into these products and therefore the price point of these products. Mm. A good quality waterproof shell jacket is an investment. Yeah. And much. people... <laughs> People buy them, they spend a lot of, you know, let's not pretend that these are cheap. These are expensive items. We buy them and I'm as guilty as this as anyone. We buy them, we wear them. That first outing is brilliant. You all love it. You love the photographs. You then throw it in your pack or the back of the car or it gets piled on your kit store at home, you know, which might be your spare room. And, and then the next time you go out, you grab it again. And then it does. And what we don't do is we don't give these products TLC. We just assume that they're going to work because the old version always worked. They hung in a cupboard for six months of the year and you pulled them out and they worked. These products now need a little more TLC. The same way that you would look after, you know, your, your phone or your car or all these other high-end products, we need to look after them. And I think we have encouraged consumers, we've educated consumers that it's really hard to do don't touch them, leave them alone. You don't understand. They're too technical for you to be able to do at home. And the reality is we've got to change that. So I think we run a service center. So if, if you buy a RAB product, you can put it through our service center. Um, interestingly, about three, four years ago, we now included a RAB technical waterproof wash in that service center. So as well as all of the great down wash and care we do, we now do RAB waterproof technical wash. Um, but we've now got pages and pages on our website, and I know many other brands have as well, around how consumers can look after and wash and care for their products. And I think we need to encourage consumers to look after their products at the end of that trip or that expedition or whatever they've done, not 10 minutes before they're sprinting out of the house late on the next one. Um, that will ensure that their products last better and, and work better. But we also need to really give consumers confidence that it's okay to wash these products. They need to be washed carefully, for sure. You can't just throw it in the washing machine with your, your usual laundry powder, but you know, you're chatting with Granger's next. There are specialist solutions out there available. One thing that I have learned more recently is actually a little bit of heat treatment really, really helps to reignite the solution that's already on your product. So, you know, we're not talking hot irons and hot tumble dryers here, but a cool iron um, or a cool tumble dryer actually helps to really bring some of the solutions back to life. So sometimes it's not even a wash. It's just a, a, a kind of a quick spin in a tumble dryer. 
We actually carried out some research last this time last year with consumers on it through our website. And we asked them questions about how regularly do you wash your items? How comfortable are you? And the data we got back was really quite terrifying in that um, I think over 30, or 37%, so a good chunk of our consumers never wash their products mm. because probably we've told them and others that it's too difficult to do. Of the ones that do, 27% said they would um, never reproof because reproofing is too complicated for them and they don't trust it and they think it will damage the product. Um, so it's really interesting that we've almost led this mythology about how difficult it is and you shouldn't do it. And actually with the new fabrics, it's far more different. I would say, you know, probably every, you know, every couple of months, every third or fourth use, every bit, you need to at least be rinsing it off at least giving it some sort of um, soft wash um, and then maybe looking at reproofing it every sort of season or so. And I, I think back to your back to your point about high end products that I was I, in my straight in my head came boots. You know, you treat your boots every time you come back with them wet or covered in bog back to the earlier yeah. conversation we had you're gonna you're gonna wash them off and dry them properly you know you're not you're not gonna stick them i don't i don't know well yeah we do stick them in front of the fire fairly regularly but no, you know don't. you got you, no i know exactly i know exactly that's that, that, that yeah bad example but it, <laughs> it's almost like we should be treating our jackets in a similar way as far as removing any any muck or or that that treatment process and 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 drying them appropriately I guess rather than cramming them down into the bottom of the rucksack and then just chucking them in a cupboard which yeah which is standard isn't it yeah I one of the products I looked at last week in the durability workshop um the entire hood had delaminated of this product and we were trying to work out the reason why uh we initially thought it was maybe hairspray or hair product a hair product then we wondered if it was mid repellent then we wondered if it was sunscreen what it turned out was it was a product that had been constantly stored in the back of a, a backpack, but it had been stuffed inside the hood. Oh. So the inside of the hood had been damaged. But of course, that product was now end of life because the hood didn't work anymore. Mm. So it is about how you care for those products and how you store them when they're not being used. Mm. If you only wear it for one three hour, five hour hike, and then it's in the, your backpack screwed up for another three weeks before you pull it out again. Okay. It is little, you know, the, the, the little reason to believe that it's going to perform particularly well. It's going to smell pretty bad too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I think, but I kind of just want to um, wrap up with, because we're kind of coming to the end of our time and we could just talk on this for ages, mm. um, is about partnerships. And so uh, us as a small specialist independent retailer uh, and RAB as a, as a huge, you know, corporation, We've been working together for the last, um, I think it's getting on for three years now, it might be four. Um, we work together to create, um, it's just a small little flyer that we keep in the shop in our waterproof section. And it just really helps bust that. I'm glad you used the word myth because it is almost urban myth, you know, um, just to explain to customers and give them the power and let them understand that um, they are in control of, uh, of how their waterproof is going to perform throughout its lifetime. And, uh, and that just explains how, um, how to wash clean your garment. We give away um, a free sample, small one wash sample of Granger's um, and uh, with every, uh, every waterproof. And it is that simple. You just put it in your washing machine. You give it a buzz in the tumble dryer or a hot iron. It really is simple. But I think that's pretty much covered everything for now because we're going to run out of time Wayne I <laughs> know I know I know sorry yeah um we, that, that yeah I'm not just my mind's buzzing with everything <laughs> you've just been coming out with which is why I've been unusually quiet it's given me lots of uh, stuff to reflect on so yeah th that's it from us thanks to Debbie that was episode 47 of Outdoor Gear Chat and um, we'll be carrying on the conversation at uh, Kendall Mountain Festival in the very near future we will. I mean, how exciting is this? And uh, um, we will be at the Kendall Mountain Festival 2024, um, not just talking to suppliers uh, behind a microphone, but we are actually going to be in person recording a podcast live in the barrel room. Um, I didn't actually realise it was going to be a live podcast, uh, live audience when we signed up for this, Wayne. You, you, you <laughs> neglected to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> look at look at me look at me grinning and I'm yeah and, and in fairness as I said to you I am terrified about the prospect as well it's home 
very much home turf for me. Born within, what well, born within a mile of where we'll be recording the the in the barrel room. I, I was so yeah, yeah. It would be fantastic. I can't, I can't, I really can't wait to interview no, you and I'm Jackie really, on stage. Yeah. Really, really, really looking forward to it. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a, a, a mental few days, isn't it? But it is, um, it is, yeah, right. what what a privilege and a massive thank you to the Kendall team for allowing us to be oh, you know, to, to be part of this. We're we're so psyched. <laughs> Oh, in the meantime, um, the discussion about waterproofs goes on and on and on. <laughs> and uh, you can find out more uh, simply by coming in the shop and having a chat with us. That's the best way. Um, or you can go online to www.climbers-shop.com. There's also information at our sister shop, uh, sister's site, the uh, www.joebrownoutdooracademy.com. And RAB also have a fantastic array of information on their um, RAB.equipment website. If you just look for the responsibility tag, there is a wealth of information in there. There will also be links in the show notes uh, underneath this on the podcast description. So if you want to find out more, Please take a look there and click.